Good day, everyone. I hope you are doing all uh, well. Thank you very much for those who join us today. Uh, I know it's Friday, uh, so much appreciated for uh, joining us. I am Abdel Fattah uh, Mahdi, the Chair of Democratic Transition, Transition Project at the Arab Center uh, for Research. And welcome to the annual conference on democracy and democratic transition. The theme of this year uh, is constitutions and democratic transition in the Arab region. We are so delighted to welcome Dr. Tom Ginsberg uh, as a keynote speaker for this year. The title of his lecture is The Right to Repel in Comparative Constitutional Law. Professor uh, Tom Ginsberg is a well-known uh, scholar at the University of uh, uh, Chicago Law School. He is a uh, professor of international law, uh, research scholar, and professor of political science. He holds PA, uh, JD, and PhD degrees uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, his latest book, How to Save a Constitutional Democracy, was written with Aziz uh, Haq, published in uh, 2018. He wrote extensively on law, uh, democracy, and constitutions. His books include the Judicial Review in New Democracies, 2003, The Endurance of uh, National Constitutions, 2009. Uh, he currently uh, co-directs the Comparative uh, Constitutions Project. In addition, he works uh, with many international development agencies and foreign governments in constitutional reform. He's a member of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you here, Dr. Tom, and uh, the floor is yours for 45 uh, minutes, please. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Mahdi, and thank you to everyone who has organized this conference. Uh, and I only wish we could meet in person. Inshallah, we'll do that next year or some future time. That would be wonderful. Uh, my work for most of my career, both before and after becoming a professor, was on the topic of democratization. Uh, and now recently I've been working on, unfortunately, the other transitions, the other kind of transitions, which is democracies that backslide into autocratic regimes. And it's very much an issue in the United States today. Many people are talking about this. Many Americans are concerned about it. So, um, uh, you know, I'm very happy to be here. I think it's a really important topic and uh, wonderful to be able, able to share some thoughts with you about uh, the right to rebel. And um, what I'm going to do is to, uh, let's see, start with a, a PowerPoint and then I'll, I'll kind of go in and out of the PowerPoint. I want to introduce myself a little bit in my work. Um, and I do a lot of work with this, uh, with, as Dr. Mahdi mentioned, something called the Comparative Constitutions Project. And one of our projects is this website, the Constitute website, where you can look at all the constitutions, in this case, in Arabic, uh, of the world. The Arabic set is not as big as the English language set, uh, but between the two of them, they're, you know, you, you, you're able to find any constitution. And so it allows one, in this case today, I can look for provisions in constitutions which are about the right to rebel. There's also quite a bit of data and I'll just share a little bit of it before I start uh, talking specifically about the right to rebel. So the project, which Dr. Mahdi mentioned, began about uh, uh, 10, 12 years ago. And what we decided to do was to gather information on all of the constitutions of the world. And um, the, what we looked only at independent countries that were widely recognized. And in almost every case, Nowadays, you can find a single document which is called a constitution, a text. Uh, of course, there are some others. We all know in Saudi, there's no constitution. They have these basic statutes. So in those cases, a small number, we look at the laws that create or suspend a branch of government. But uh, all of this means there are over 220 or 30 countries that have existed since 1789. Some disappeared. 
Um, and that means over 900 constitutions that we can examine and look at trends. And so it's a good feel to attack a problem like the right to rebel, the right of revolution. How do written constitutions treat it? How do they think about the problem? And where do they exist? So my research agenda in some sense is what are the causes of constitutional uh, provisions and what are their consequences in the real world? How do they change actual behavior? And just to give you an introduction, in this particular slide, we show uh, the number of countries in the world, you can see on the left vertical axis, which has gone from you know, less than 50 to almost 200 now. Of course, decolonization, many new countries, many countries in your part of the world are, are young in, as nation states. And um, the top line, uh, it reflects the number of countries. That's the black line. The dashed line is the number of countries which have a written constitution. And the very interesting thing here is that you can see that by about 1950, 1940, those two things come together. So that when a new country appears on the world stage, one of the first things it does is a draft a new constitution. It's a signal that we're a real country uh, you, because, you know, that other because we've adopted a constitution. It tells the rest of the world that we are, are real. And again, a small number of exceptions, but most countries do that. The other thing you can observe is the bars, which are the number drafted in any given year. And there you can see that these constitutions tend to come in waves. So back in 1848 in Europe, there was something they call springtime of nations. Many new nation states emerged, many constitutions. Then after World War I, after World War II, the end of the Cold War, we see a lot of constitutions and a lot of reforms. And this means that the texts tend to be clustered uh, in time. That is, if you want to know something about uh, a constitution, looking at when it was drafted is very important. I think that's important for thinking about the constitutions of the, of the Arab world. Of course, another really important thing is where they are drafted. Um, this divides that sample into authoritarian and democratic constitutions. And by this, I'm defining authoritarian constitution as a constitution drafted in an authoritarian regime, in a year in which a regime was authoritarian. We sometimes have, and it's very important for the broader theme of this conference, we sometimes observe constitutions drafted in authoritarian regimes that then serve as the basis for democratization. Uh, and a good example would be Chile. That's uh, not, the current constitution in Chile was drafted by the military dictator, and it contains all of these provisions which secure his interests and those of his class. But it allowed a democratic transition, and today Chile is very democratic. And actually, they're debating finally, uh, I guess, 40 years later, drafting a true constitution, even though they've been a democracy for 30 years under that constitution. So that's a very interesting phenomenon, um, that there is that possibility. Of course, uh, most monarchies in the world are what we call constitutional monarchies, in which the monarch is constrained by the constitution. And many of those are very old constitutions that were drafted when we wouldn't call the country a democracy. But through a long process of negotiation with the parliament and the people, the Rulers lost, uh, the kings lost some power and the people gained power, but the monarchy survived. So that's an important thing to observe too. Now the Middle East is, un, is unique, I suppose, distinct regionally. And I draw here, actually I'll say a word about it before going to the next slide. I draw here on the work of my friend Nathan Brown, who I know is joining uh, today, but also on this sort of large statistical work that I have done. And when you look around the world at types of government, you see in the Middle East a very specific type, which is, of course, absolute monarchy. Looking all over the world, I'd say there are eight countries that can be classified as absolute monarchies today. And six of them are in the Middle East. And then the only ones not there are uh, Brunei and then Swaziland in Africa is an absolute monarchy, but very, very rare form of government. Much more common, of course, are mixed monarchies like, and I would include Morocco, and Jordan in this category. But uh, the preservation of absolute monarchy obviously is means that these are really strongly authoritarian <laughs> constitutions. In addition, when you look at the constitutions of the region, 
They tend to be shorter. They tend to have a lot of executive power and they tend to be pretty stable, right? We don't see a lot of amendments. Countries like India or Brazil, they're amending the constitution every single year. Uh, and these are not, that's not the case here uh, in this part of the world. Now, looking at uh, this time and space together, we can say that what determines the contents of constitutions is kind of a combination of the two. And one of the things we've done is look at different regions over time. So in this figure, you see uh, seven different regions of the world. Um, and you see uh, we have these kind of indexes, indices, measuring various aspects of the Constitution. And then you can see how it evolves over time. So at the very top, you see Latin America uh, in 1950 already had a pretty very rights intensive Constitution. It's one of the features of that region. They love rights. They don't always implement them, but they love having them. And then you see over time how they've expanded the number of rights in the written text. Uh, and so the interesting thing from the point of view of the, the, the Arab region, of course, is that that yellow bar indicates the current level of protection of rights in the Constitution. You can see it's the least, the lowest of any region, right? And so even though it has expanded a little bit, still fairly, fairly low. So all of this is to say that if I want to know what's in a constitution in the Arab world, I can almost guess without actually reading the text because of these forces, regional and uh, temporal, that drive the text. Just two other slides here, and then I'll turn to the main topic. Um, this looks at the, the detail about picking the executive, picking the prime minister. Uh, and you can see that the Middle East is really not very much detail compared with the other regions. Um, there's also an interesting thing in that this is something where it's not always growing. And then this is just one other criminal procedure, also very low levels of protection in the Constitution. So this means, of course, that these constitutions are, um, well, there's room, obviously, for, for um, development. Okay, let me pause. So our main topic, uh, of course, is uh, the right to rebel. And, and from a very long time, political thinkers have been thinking, have been trying to grapple with the phenomenon of popular power of the people. Um, and so first of all, let me just say that rebellion is really rare. Successful rebellion is really rare. It's a revolutionary kind of situation, a revolutionary constitution. I mean, I can think of obviously Egypt and then Iran as countries in, in your neighborhood, which have had, uh, um, at least one experience and sometimes more with this kind of experience, with this kind of phenomenon. But it is very um, obviously tricky. It's tricky to uh, pull off and it's tricky to um, have it be, it lead to a good result. And both of those things are very relevant to the discussion. Why is it tricky to pull off? The fundamental political problem is one of what we call coordination, a coordination problem. And you're probably familiar with this, but I'll just give some simple examples. A coordination problem is when two actors or more have uh, a need to agree on a particular thing uh, in order to coordinate their behavior, but it's sometimes difficult to figure out what they want. To, they, they both want an answer. They might disagree as to which answer is the one they want, but once an answer is provided, they will both sort of follow the rules. You know, a very simple example is often given is which side of the street are we going to drive on? As you know, some countries, they drive on the right, some they drive on the left. And if you uh, dropped yourself in the middle of a country and you didn't know, well, um, you know, you would probably look around and you would follow the rules. This is a good example of a coordination problem where we don't really care what the answer is. There's no benefit to driving on the right or driving on the left. But if you, uh, what you do want is that there must be an answer. We couldn't have a society where people are, uh, you know, just choosing on their own. Actually in Sweden, I think in the 1970s, they actually changed from driving on the right to driving on the left. I can't imagine why or what difficulties that created, 
but uh, Swedes are very law abiding. So I managed that. I guess it didn't produce a lot of accidents. Um, if you and I are dropped into the middle of a planet and we each have a car and there's a road and we're driving on it, we want to know, should I drive on the right or drive on the left? And it is possible for someone to help us solve that problem even without law, even without coercion. The, imagine that in this hypothetical, someone comes out in the middle of the road, we don't know them, they're not wearing a uniform, not a policeman, and they point, drive on the right. That is a good example of a self-enforcing pronouncement. I will think to myself, well, this person is not, has no power over me, but it will be very wise for me to follow him. Because I think that this person is probably trying, saying the same thing to the other person, the other driver. And knowing that the other driver knows that he's pointing this, pointing this out to me, I believe that very likely that the other driver will follow the same pet strategy. And this is a very basic game theory. Maybe it's familiar to many of you. But in this kind of situation, the big point is we need to coordinate our behavior and you don't need power to do so. Don't need an authority. You just need agreement. Now, why is this relevant to the right to rebel? Well, in the right to in, in rebellion or revolution, coordination is a massive problem. Suppose we have a society uh, of 100 people and 10 of them support the regime and 10 of them are maybe in the security services. And the rest of us are oppressed. Well, uh, what exactly can we do about it? We might all think, recognize that we are oppressed and feel very bad about the regime and wish we could change it. But it will be very hard for us to coordinate. A first thing we must sort of agree upon is that there is a better alternative. And a very important point in sustaining authoritarianism is the idea that if it's not me, it's going to be something really, really bad. And I do think that there are some revolutions which lead to worse results. I have an Iranian friend. I don't want to maybe talk too many politics, but my Iranian friend thinks that's what happened in 1979 there. Um, and, of course, that means that you have, you know, bullies like, you know, trying to stay in power in this, uh, by saying, oh, don't, you need me because there's going to be something else. So that's one thing we have to agree on before the 90 can overthrow the 10. Another thing is that we must agree on when exactly to come out, right? What exactly is the violation that pushes things over the edge? And, uh, you know, the Tunisian fruit seller no one could have predicted that that would be a thing that would change the, the, the region, change the country and change the region. But it, it was. Um, what are the violations? We have to all agree on that. Not only that, we have to agree on where we are going to come out and uh, when we're going to come out in order to protest. It's very, very hard. 90 people have a lot more time, difficulty coordinating than two. In my driving on the road example, but you can't have a revolution or even resistance with only two. And the reason is obvious. If two people come out and say, oh, we're gonna overthrow the government, we're gonna rebel today. Well, the government has a very easy chance, an easy time throwing those two in jail and finding out who their friends are and such. If 90 show up, the government falls. But the problem is how to coordinate. And much of my uh, theme here is that a right to rebel in a constitution, a written right, can help the coordination, at least in theory. That written constitutions, one of the things they are good for is helping people to coordinate on all kinds of things, including the question of when or not to uh, come out in the streets. And just to make that point, you know, if you think about it, of course, there is a um, uh, constitutions are full of problems 
full of solutions to coordination problems. So, uh, you know, we might all agree that, that here's a very trivial problem, which is very important to put in a written constitution. What is the uh, day on which one leader has to turn over power to another? Actually, it's a major debate in my country. I'm shocked to say, I can't even believe it. But according to our law, uh, on January 20th, there will be a new presidency. And now we have a president, it's unheard of, it's unbelievable, who is threatening not to obey that rule if he loses power. Um, as an aside, I can say that if he does lose the electoral college, he will surely be out of office on that day. We have institutions, we don't have, uh, the, the, the security forces do not report directly to him, they report to the office of the presidency. So it's a little bit of just a threat. But the key thing is that there's a date. And it doesn't matter if it's January 20th or February 20th or December 20th. There is a date that we all know. And once that uh, date is passed, then the president tries to keep power and even pulls out the security forces. The American people will rebel. There will be you know, tens of millions of people in the street. And knowing that, the security forces have already said, we're not going to help you to President Trump. We have no interest in helping you because they know that such a rebellion would put them in conflict with the people and they feel, you know, they are the people basically. So it's a very interesting time here in the United States to understand the dynamics of exactly how democracy is sustained. It requires agreement on the rules, solving very simple coordination problems if using law and constitutions in writing. And then of course, the real key thing, the underlying agreement in the society that certain things will count as violations, which would trigger rebellion. And it also, I suppose, an agreement in the security forces that they won't repress such a rebellion. And if you have those things, you have democracy. Okay? But the coordination point is the part I want to emphasize. A written text can really help in helping to solve these problems of groups getting together and coming out. Um, now, what is the right to rebel? Let's see. What is the right to rebel? Um, you can, um, you know, it's something that there's a lot, as I say, an old debate in political theory. And there's a very nice article by Tony Honoré, who just passed away, a British jurisprudence person. <clears throat> um, you know, ties it to violence. It's justified violence in order to do one of three things. And there's sort of three different uh, possibilities. To overthrow an unjust leader, to resist the overthrow of a just leader, someone who's properly elected and someone comes in tries to take over, then the right to rebel is conservative in character. Not radical, but conservative, trying to preserve the constitutional order against a usurper. And third, to secure the right to independence. And this has a very specific meaning, but, probably, but as we'll see in the context of decolonization, if you had a colonial power that did not get out of the way, Rhodesia in the 1960s, well, then the violence that is exercised against the Rhodesian state is justified because they were, uh, were keeping a people from exercising its right to self-determination. So that's a kind of special 20th century version, post-colonial version. But the first two, I think, are more enduring. When can the people overthrow the government? Or when can they come out to defend the government and use violence that would otherwise be illegal? So that's the key point. To do things which otherwise would not be acceptable but it is justified in a particular case. And this is a debate, again, the United States, I can't believe the United States is so relevant to all these debates. But you have some people who are protesting uh, in favor of uh, black lives who are oppressed, you know, oppressed group, who uh, justify the destruction of property as saying, well, this is justified violence. So that's a kind of saying it's a rebellion. And some people use the term rebellion 
I personally don't, but that's a separate discussion. So there's an old debate in political and democratic theory. Now, I, I know to, that this, there is a second order character to this right. What do I mean by second order character? The right to rebel is invoked or possible only when there's been a violation of some other right, some other duty on the part of the state. Only when that occurs does this one come in place. So it's kind of a, it doesn't have any content of its, of its own, except as an exception to the ordinary duty, I suppose, to obey the law. So certain violations might trigger this right. That gives it a second order character. So we have to define those circumstances in order to say when it would be acceptable. And of course, it goes back a long time. I'm a student of East Asia. So I always go for, uh, it, it, for the, and, and in China, you have a very long tradition of this kind of thought. Um, going back actually to the Bronze Age, but this fellow Mencius is usually uh, associated with it uh, because he crystallized the idea in something called the mandate of heaven. What is the mandate of heaven? The mandate of heaven was the idea that if a ruler was good and righteous, then the heavens would themselves recognize that. And there would be good times. The crops would be full. There would be order in society. There would be peace, no war. It comes from a very different religious perspective than uh, us, than people in the Arab world or people in the Western world, because we're in a world where there's a realm of God and a realm of man, and they're very different. We have God's law and we have human law. Uh, in, the, in the Chinese thought, they didn't see that kind of separation. And so from their point of view, the righteous ruler would uh, you know, behave properly, and that would lead the universe itself to respond in a kind of you know, supportive way. But if the ruler was bad, it wasn't that the ruler would be punished by God so much, it's that the mandate would be removed. The mandate, meaning the, 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 the ability to rule um, in a peaceful, just way. And then there would be chaos. Now, interestingly, even though this sounds, uh, and th what did this justify? It justified the change in rulers. Those who know anything about China, you know, they've had many, many dynasties. We're currently in the Communist Party, Mao Zedong dynasty. But of course, Chinese history is about a lot of different dynasties. And this theory justified the change in dynasties, if you think about it, right? The institutions kept going, but the rulers changed because they had lost the mandate of heaven. Now, I mentioned it, it is not precisely a right to rebel, because it was more like a justification for any revolutions that happened to occur. But there was no, nothing in this theory which said, oh, the people, the peasants can come out and change the ruler, right? A true right to rebel requires the people to be able to exercise it. And this did not have that. But it was a kind of framework for thinking about what is just government, and I think it continues, by the way, to have a lot of influence. A just government should provide for the people, should have uh, economic well-being is a very important thing that was important to mention. And so these ideas do have continuing influence, but I consider this kind of a precursor. I don't want to say much about the Islamic tradition because I don't know, and you all do. So, uh, But I will say that we can find both the very wise idea from the prophet, peace be upon him, that uh, you know, there's merit in obeying authority. And I think this gets to the idea that sometimes you know, the alternative could be worse. Chaos isn't particularly good. But of course, because Islam has a, uh, 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 you know, is um, rooted, of course, in the law of God, right? We have a clearly an external standard of justice against which to judge the worldly rulers. And that, that difference, I suppose, might allow in some circumstances, and there's hadith on this, you know, uh, for the exercise of a right to rebellion. Again, it's not my field, but I do recognize that Islam has uh, um, roots, has grappled with these ideas itself. And I think, uh, you know, has some wise things to, to build upon. For liberal countries like mine, 
we tend to go back to two great thinkers, Hobbes and Locke. And Thomas Hobbes wrote this in 1650. And he had the idea of what he called the social contract, uh, where it became known as the social contract. The government was designed to prevent the war of all against all. It was designed to provide order. And uh, so you have a kind of covenant between the government and the people. But for Hobbes, and this quote uh, sort of captures it, he did not think that there was necessarily a right to rebel. And the key problem was this. If the sovereign violated the rights of the people, who was the judge? Who could judge the sovereign? Of course, God could judge. But there was no human institution to judge the sovereign. The people themselves were not allowed to uh, make such a judgment. And so if there was a breach of the social contract, then you went back to this chaos state of nature. And that was bad from his point of view, right? Because solving this problem of coordination around the government was a very good thing. So um, he doesn't seem to think much of the right to rebel. But then about 100 years later, we have John Locke. It was very important in our thinking. Whenever the legislators endeavor to take away and destroy the property of the people or reduce them to slavery, they are in a state of war with the people who need not obey. So Locke is the key point in terms of liberal thought for a right to rebel. And he was extremely influential on the founders of my country. Actually, many of our state constitutions still have provisions allowing the people to rebel. Um, so these are in Kentucky. They point out that all power is inherent in the people. Sovereignty comes from the people. And um, the very this last sentence for the advancement of these ends, the people have always have an inalienable and indefeasible, undefeatable right to alter, reform, or abolish the government. So there is a right to rebel at the state level in the United States, although not at the national level but it's certainly a part of our political culture. And we have many other examples in our thought. And of course, we have other sources too. The French Declaration on the Rights of Man, obviously a revolutionary document, saw resistance to oppression as a natural right, just like liberty, property, and security. Now, in the 20th century, we've had a lot of wrestling with this <clears throat> because we have many more countries Many of those countries are very weak and don't necessarily want everyone to rebel every time they're unhappy with the government. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a very interesting statement on this. Where is it essential if man is not to be compelled to uh, have uh, recourse to rebellion against tyranny and oppression? The human rights should be protected. So here are the ideas that, as it's, all, it's both a positive and a normative, statement. It's a positive statement saying, if you don't protect human rights, there's going to be rebellion, but also seems to say that there is such a right, right? By recognizing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it seems to be a little bit like John Locke. So that means, but it's, at the same time, it's not encouraging the exercise of this right. And what it's trying to do is say, governments, be nice to your people, or they will overthrow you. So that's a very interesting 20th century source. And then of course we have a very famous declaration by the UN General Assembly on friendly relations uh, of 1970, which says basically that if you are subject to alien domination, then you do have a right to resist. And so that's again, this kind of post-colonial right. All right, so lots of different sources. Now, when are we going to see them in constitutions? national constitutions. Well, um, an important theory of what we put into constitutions is what's called pre-commitment. Pre-commitment. I am tying my hands today to uh, uh, limit myself in the future in order to make things possible that might not, not otherwise be. The idea of in the Universal Declaration was something of this um, idea. Governments give your people rights because otherwise they're gonna overthrow you. And giving the people rights, of course, is a way of tying the hands of government, saying, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna you know, arrest people arbitrarily. I'm not going to interfere with freedom of speech. 
because, and, and the point is that pre-commitment means I'm taking thing powers away from myself in order to make a promise that would be believed by the people. And from this point of view, you might imagine it would make a lot of sense for governments to put a right to rebel in the constitution, like the American states. To say, look, people, we're gonna be nice to you. If not, come and, um, uh, you know, then you're free to overthrow us. It's a hands tying regime. And having that text in the constitution would allow the citizens then to have a standard because they would say, oh, you violated these provisions of the constitution, we can coordinate our behavior and all agree to come out on the same day at the same time to exercise the right to rebel. So putting in the constitution might facilitate better government and uh, by virtue of the threat of rebellion. And we do see this in some countries. Um, we also see, I suppose, the defensive approach, which is we want the people to be able to resist if someone tries to overthrow the government. So in the 1960s, um, in the German constitution, they added, and this is in the face of big student protests, they added a right to resistance, saying anyone trying to abolish our constitutional order can resist and come out uh, as a last resort. That's a key point I haven't made, but right to rebel only is the very last resort. You have to try all the other channels. Um, and similarly, the post Cold War East European countries also adopted it, I think in this kind of democratic way. So that's one reason we might see this. But we also observe a different phenomenon, which was surprising to me, but it makes sense when you say it. You might also observe a right to rebellion in constitutions which were written by people who themselves were rebels. That is, people who came to power unconstitutionally themselves might seek to justify their rule by saying, ah, oh, the people have a right to rebel. And I was just exercising the people's right to rebel. So this is not forward looking, it's a backward looking reason to write the text. And that's a very important point about the, these written constitutions. We think of them, oh, it's the fundamental rules of government. But of course, in many countries, uh, you know, they are, constitutions in a non-constitutional world is Nathan Brown's book. You know, they're not meant to be actually implemented. They're meant to be political documents to justify various things. And so we do have many dictators who have used the right to rebel uh, as justification for their own role. And I would point to the last example there, Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela in 1999 said, um, you know, we disown any regime that violates democratic values, principles, or encroaches upon human rights. Um, and uh, there was actually more than this about a right to rebel. And that is because the man who wrote the constitution, Hugo Chavez, has himself tried to uh, pull off a coup and uh, then failed, but he eventually took power. And so he wanted to justify the right of rebellion. So you might imagine in the Arab world, like Saddam Hussein or someone might have done something like this. Oh, you know, it was legitimate. So we see this. Now, looking around the world um, at the texts which have these rights to resist, and I would focus not on the left side because this is a percentage of constitutions. And so at the very beginning of the period, there weren't very many con constitutions at all. You may remember from the earlier slide. But beginning around 1950, we see many more. And now it's 20% of all countries have a right to rebellion, a right to resist unjust authority. Very interesting. Uh, my colleagues and I studied them to try to see what determines these constitutional clauses. And I won't bore you with the regression results, but I will uh, summarize them and say that both of our theories, both the positive theory, the forward-looking theory and the backward-looking theory seem to predict when a country will put a right to rebellion in its constitution. Um, both democratic transitions tend to lead to the right to resistance, but also if you had a coup in the last five years, although this is almost exclusively Latin America, I should say that we don't see these clauses in the Arab world, and it's an interesting question. And they're found in every other region of the world, but none, you know, Saddam Hussein did not put this in here when he had his, in his constitution when he had the Ba'athist coup. 
Um, and I'm not sure why, maybe it has to do with these deeper cultural things, but it's, a, it's very interesting that the Arab region is quite distinct, even in this regard. Uh, because we see trends around the world, you know, one of the things we look at was, is there was global adoption, a propensity of the constitutions to adopt this thing uh, in the previous year, does that lead to more adoption of rights to rebel? And we find no a negative relationship there. Um, but both democracies and countries that are prone to coups tend to have the right to rebel. So it's very interesting. We see this kind of bimodal is the word I would use. That is two kind, two distributions of circumstances in which you would get them. Um, now there's various textual differences. So, you know, who can you rebel against? Who can you use it against? Is it, uh, you could imagine a constitutional provision says there's only a right to rebel if there's a military coup, which would be probably a good thing from that point of view of the way democracy is maintained that I was referring to in talking about the United States. If the military knows that uh, a coup is going to be followed by a revolution, they're not going to revolt. Um, certainly an invasion or something like that. The other difference is sometimes we see that it is a right of the people and sometimes we see that it is a duty of the people to rebel. And that textual difference may be subtle, but of course a, a duty means that they have to and a right means they can't. And so uh, the obligation might help a uh, leader to use this right to rebel defensively. Finally, um, there's the question of if it's, sort of individual resistance against unjust authority, or actually the right to go out in the streets and rebel and overthrow them. I'm talking mainly about the latter, but sometimes we see language of just resist. We don't have to obey unjust authority. Doesn't mean we have the right to go out with the, uh, you know, and use violence. And so various, various definitions. Now, I have focused in most of my talk here on actual written constitutions and not on what comparative constitutional law usually looks at. So comparative constitutional law, my field, tends to focus on written cases, right? On case law um, and how they, you know, how judges interpret things. But the fact is, we don't have a lot of data on this. The only time we tend to see cases is when, is in the military dictatorship cases where, uh, a military takes over and then goes to the courts and wants to justify its rule by saying, oh, we were exercising the authority to resist these corrupt democratic leaders. So you sometimes see such cases, but they're not very interesting. Um, uh, and we don't really see it at the individual level. Oh, he was just resisting unjust authority. Very few cases. So it's almost like this is a realm of political science or comparative constitutional law in which the law matters, in my view. But it matters for coordination and it matters for justification. It doesn't matter so much about the courts. And that's unusual in my field of comparative constitutional law. We also have to do better to distinguish the cause and effect. So I've talked a lot about why we have these provisions. What's the effect? Do countries that have them have fewer riots? Does it help the opposition to come together? and thus lead to better governance or not. And that I haven't done yet. I think in the democratic cases, you know, they tend to be pretty good governments, but then the question is, wouldn't they be anyway? So it's, if you compare countries that have such a right and those that don't, there's lots of missing variables in doing that comparison. Um, and finally, and I think it's the big question, is to, you know, what is the, um, what alternative means of controlling authoritarian regimes are there? So obviously, the right to rebel is a very important one, but it's very much a last resort one. And what most of the things I think about in my work are about institutional designs well before you get to that point. So how do you make sure that the authoritarian regime is not so oppressive that you have to resort to this right? And because at the end of the day, it's very unpredictable. I go back to the Tunisian fruit seller. No one had any idea that that would be the day or the time or the month or the incident. And it's unpredictability means you can't really rely on it. So for regular governance, it's obviously better to look at the, the ordinary constitutional regime and try to think of ways 
so that the right to rebel will not be necessary or used. And this is where that I return to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? If we have human rights, then you're not going to need the right to rebel. It's just a background thing in the deep theory of the state that sovereignty lies with the people at some level. And if you're too unjust, you're going to find yourself, um, um, you know, out. And, you know, I think the history of governments show that that is the case, notwithstanding whatever the theory of sovereignty is. The sovereignty belonged to God or the king. At the end of the day, there's a real bargain between rulers and the rule that I think exists in every society. And violations of those bargains will sometimes lead to the rule exercising in very uncertain times, very unpredictable times, their right to rebel or duty to rebel against unjust authority. Well, I've talked for, I think, 45 minutes or, or so. I obviously could keep going, but would love to uh, hear questions if there are any in the chat or anything like that. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Dr. Tom. This is a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, uh, you know, it's a very important topic in the Arab region. We have uh, ongoing uprisings since uh, 2011, and I think uh, we will back uh, we'll get back to this topic later on. I think. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you uh, today here in the conference. So we have uh, about uh, 15 minutes break. Then we will come back to the first session, Dr. Sultan Barakat will be the chair of this session, and uh, we'll see you then uh, later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been quite an honor. Thank you.